Thank you so much, Verena, and thank you for sharing how an all-in approach can get us to at least 50% by 2030. We do have our work cut out for us, though, but Blueprint 2030 is showing us the way. I now have the great pleasure of welcoming co-chair of America is All In, Washington Governor Jay Inslee. He has been all in on climate throughout his decade of public service, and we are so grateful to have him here with us today. Governor Inslee is a fifth generation Washingtonian and is currently serving an historic third term as governor. Governor Inslee, nice to see you again and welcome. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for everybody on this call. Uh, I am so thrilled to join you. I think these are great days to have uh, fellow climate warriors across the globe. It is a great time to be alive because this is a moment of the greatest peril of during our species existence. But uh, therefore, it's the greatest moment where we can do big, good, grand, successful things. So it's a joy to join you. Thanks for the, the Climate Registry for their support of, of our ongoing efforts. I just want to build on what uh, Mr. Kennedy had to say about, about uh, really assessing uh, America's ability to step up to the plate. And what I'd like to point out is that when the international community looks at America, they need to realize this is the United States of America. This is a, a federation of states. And when you judge our success, we're going to encourage the world to look at our states because our states are moving the ball big time. Uh, I, I've helped lead the, the U.S. Climate Alliance, which now has 25 states who have made these commitments of 50 percent reductions who are taking meaningful measures and are actually uh, moving the ball in this regard. So we want uh, our states to both uh, show the world what we're capable of doing in America through state action. And fortunately, we're not alone. Uh, we are leading a group of, uh, of leaders of provinces and states and parishes and cities around the world at COP to, to uh, in some sense, do our own thing to show what we can really do, to be the spearhead of this, S, of, uh, of this effort of municipalities and states. Now, we are uh, through a derogatory term in a lot of international conferences, we have been referred to as subnationals. Uh, we think that is grossly misstating our role. We believe we are supernationals. And we are supernationals because of a, we can lead our nation states because frequently we can accomplish things with more dexterity, more speed, and more ambition than our nation states. And so we want to energize all of these uh, supernationals to join us at COP. We've got 30 communities have already joined us on this uh, effort from uh, Jeju province in, in Korea to uh, Sao Paulo, to, uh, to uh, Jalisco, to the Western Cape in South Africa, to Minas Gerais in Brazil. This is really an exciting moment where the supernationals can lead the world. And our role is, I think, twofold at COP, and our importance is twofold at, at, at COP. One, to actually demonstrate what is working today, and we have great stories to tell. Don't tell us we can't move the needle on this. Uh, my state, we've embraced the, the most ambitious cap and invest program with the greatest environmental justice provisions so that we target investments to overburdened communities. Uh, we've got a clean fuel standard. We've got a 100% clean electrical grid standard. Uh, many of our states have joined us in those efforts. We think ours is the best in Washington state, of course. But we can demonstrate to the nation states what is actually achievable, because we're building jobs like crazy. You know, the U.S. Climate Alliance of these 25 states we have, uh, we represent 61% of the whole United States economy. And those states almost uniformly have greater economic growth than the states that are not in the U.S. Climate Alliance. And we're doing that in my state. We're building electric uh, buses in, in, uh, in Ferndale. I got to see the uh, final construction of the world's first commercial all-electric airplane, a nine-seater in Arlington, Washington. We just have these stories of success. But we also have the ability to raise the ambition of our nation states. And that's an important role as well. And the ambition that we now have signed on to uh, the supranational group that we're leading does have ambitious goals. Uh, and not every city or state is going to join us in this regard. But we want to demonstrate how ambitious uh, we can be. And I'm looking forward to coming out of COP uh, with more of our, our supranationals uh, really moving the needle. So I can't wait to get there. I'm glad we're going. we got a great story to tell. 
And uh, let's have Adam. Thanks for everybody being on this call. Thank you so much, Governor Inslee, and for getting us fired up on this Friday morning and for sharing what supernational climate leadership should look like. Um, as you've mentioned, uh, Washington State has set very ambitious environmental goals, net zero emissions by 2050 with 100% renewable power. Uh, can you tell us some about of your top priorities for making these deep emissions cuts and, and reaching this goal? Well, we've got a, a, a stair step to paradise, which you always do when you have a journey like we're on. We started with our electrical grid to have 100% uh, clean electricity and with interim targets, uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2030, zero carbon by 2045. These are binding commitments, by the way. These are not aspirational targets of politicians cutting blue ribbons. These are actually legally binding on the utilities uh, where they have to meet these. And so that's an important component of this, by the way. I do sometimes weary of we politicians announcing goals with no enforceable <laughs> requirements, actually. So th there's really meat on the bone in this regard. So we've started with our uh, utilities. Then we moved uh, uh, to transportation and uh, we've adopted a clean fuel standard. I had to veto an unwise provision in it to get it in the last session of the legislature. Together with our electrification effort to have our electrical charging stations up and down our freeway system, to subsidize in our transportation package, the electrification of our utilities with electric buses, or excuse me, with our, uh, uh, with our bus uh, fleets. Uh, so transportation <clears throat> was kind of next. Then it, uh, we've also adopted an economy-wide cap and invest program. So we have an economy-wide cap and invest. It is a, uh, an economy-wide cap, which generates several billion dollars for investment in clean energy sources. We're proud of that cap and invest because it does have the best environmental justice provisions of any in the United States to make sure that we target investments to overburdened communities, to communities of color and poverty. We have 10% going to uh, tribal communities, indigenous communities, 40% going to overburdened communities. So it's really strong in environmental justice. Our next uh, goal is really to go to buildings and building efficiency. And we've, we've got some good building codes, but they're not good enough. We need to, uh, over time, decarbonize our heating and cooling of our buildings, and we need to take some actions to not, uh, to not allow the continued expansion, frankly, of gas uh, heating in, in our systems, and to continue to provide subsidization for people to upgrade their homes and businesses. So that's next on the agenda in our state. So we still got a little work to do. It's wonderful to hear, and I also want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, environmental justice in particular, and I'm so glad you mentioned the impact of climate change on these overburdened communities. And so uh, as you are trying to um, to make sure that equity and environmental justice is part of your pathway to net zero, um, what lessons have you learned and what can other jurisdictions do with similar equity issues um, to ensure that this is part of their just uh, net zero transition as well? Well, one lesson is that you have to make it uh, enterprise wide on this value uh, chain. It can't be just in your climate bill. Uh, you got to do it throughout your multiple agencies. So we passed what we call the HEAL Act, which basically embeds in our policies and in our operational decisions by multiple agencies to look at it through the lens of environmental justice. Because when you think about it, you have multiple agencies that touch on these issues. It's not just the Department of Ecology. It's the Department of Transportation. It's the Department of Commerce. It's the Department of Agriculture. All of these have an impact. So we passed a bill, I think it's the best one in the nation, that will essentially embed this lens when we make decisions of multiple agencies. Then in our climate uh, uh, bills where we generate revenues in the climate, uh, um, the cap and invest bill is the largest one. Where we do generate revenues, we target those to the overburdened communities. And it's a very explicit targeting. It's not a, uh, just a suggestion. It's a requirement. As I said, 10% for indigenous communities, 40% for those in overburdened communities. So when we do make those investments in clean energy buildings and efficiency, in uh, cooling stations and adaptation, uh, that it goes to the overburdened communities. And, that's a, and that is clearly the right thing to do. Uh, the longer I'm in this, the more I understand that the pollution, and this is, we're talking about pollution, 
is not an equal opportunity pollutant. It hits these communities hardest. I remember meeting a 14 year old girl in South Seattle who did some research. She said that she was 11 years old. She's a young Hispanic uh, leader. Uh, who said she was 11 years old before she found out that some children didn't have asthma. Everybody she knew had asthma because she lived right next to the freeway and she's breathing diesel smoke her whole 11 years. She did her own research then and showed the correlation of, of asthma and other diseases in your proximity to highways. And it's just stunning. So this is the right thing to do. And I'm really proud of our efforts and I would commend it to others. And it and politically, uh, it also helps, frankly, to get these policies over the finish line because it, it broadens the political support for our climate policies. So it's a winner in a whole bunch of perspectives. Well, thank you. Very uh, interesting insights on the importance of equity in, in climate change work. And Governor Inslee, I also know that you're, uh, there's another issue that you're very passionate about, which is, and you've spoken about frequently, which is ocean acidification, uh, which is sometimes called climate change equally evil twin. Uh, sounds like a Halloween horror movie. Um, <laughs> I know it's uh, a topic that you really care about as a coastal state. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Washington is doing, Washington is doing, and how you're working with other jurisdictions to amelior ameliorate the effects of carbon on our ocean life? Amy, by the way, I think I should have copyrighted the evil twin line. I may have been the person who came up with it. I don't know for sure, but I'm glad that you used it because I do believe it's so true. I believe that the impacts on humans will be probably just as much from the maritime side as from the terrestrial side. We, we, this is where we get, I think it's 17% of our protein. Uh, it's what we love. It's what we fish for. So this is an enormous effort and it has been way, way too, uh, too frequently ignored. So thanks for asking it. Uh, well, listen, we have, to, we have to decarbonize the international economy. That's, the, that's what we have to do fundamentally to save ourselves from ocean acidification. It's the first in the first thousand things that we have to do. And so the first thing we have to do is just add ocean acidification as a motive for actually decarbonizing our economy. Uh, and that's important politically as well to embrace all of the communities that care about the water, those who fish for salmon, those who swim, uh, those who go crabbing, uh, those who eat uh, salmon on their dinner plate, to embrace them, to get them on this from a political standpoint. Uh, so that's something we, we need to do. Second, we need to do uh, much more research in the true effects of acidification. We are just beginning to understand the consequences of changes in the pH levels uh, of the ocean. The, uh, the, we know that it can, can and already is having an adverse impact on the bottom of the food chain, on the pteropods that can actually dissolve. Uh, and by the way, I said dissolve, not melt. I said melt one time and a scientist uh, severely criticized me. It's dissolve, not melt. Uh, but we do, you can see that with your own eyes. But the question is what happens now? Where is that going? You know, what life form is gonna replace that if, if there is? These are huge unanswered questions. And the fact that we don't have answers at this moment is, 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 is very concerning, <laughs> frankly. Uh, third, we have to do the kind of work of the local things we can do to help communities adapt. Um, our shellfish industry has been hammered because you can't grow sort of baby oysters right now because the water is, is the wrong uh, pH level. And so now we're having to grow them in tanks where we, we put in soda to try to, you know, uh, uh, change the pH level. And so helping these local industries, finding new ways of doing business and, and financing that research and development. Those are important measures. We'd like to find local things we can do to change pH. We might be able to grow bull kelp in places that might absorb some and change the pH in a positive way. So there are some local things we can do, but I wanna reiterate, there is no solution to this except decarbonizing our economy and reducing methane emissions. And we just have to say that up front. The solution to ocean acidification is on the land and in our garages. And if we're going to have salmon in the rivers, we're going to have to get electric cars in our garages. Fortunately, that's happening very rapidly. Listen, we should be optimistic about this and aggressive on this. The technology is here if we deploy it. Uh, we have a company in, in our state that 
uh, has a way to increase battery capacity by maybe 50%. Uh, Ford is coming out making the F-150. We've got to accelerate. This technology is here. We just got to put it on the, on the road so we'll have salmon in the rivers. Thank you. And speaking of, of the oceans and also of, um, of charging, how is your uh, effort to, uh, to bring uh, ferries to Washington that can, that can charge? Well, uh, I'm very excited about this. We want to have the first large electric ferry in North America, and we've got that on the books, and we've financed one of them. We'd like to finance several more because we, we desperately need new boats in our state. Uh, uh, we've got this aging fleet. Our boats are older than I am. So, uh, and we want to make them electric. We've got a capacity of doing that. It's working in Norway, as you know. There's a dozen good-sized ferries working in Norway. We want to be the first in North America to get them on the water. So we're working on that. But we've got to finance them. I need the legislature to help me a little bit more to, to help finance some additional boats. But I'm very positive in ability to do that. And one of the reasons I'm positive is that the is just the pace of technological advance is just incredibly exciting. Uh, you know, I wrote a book 2007, kind of laying out what I thought would be we'd be capable of in decreasing the cost of solar and increasing the capacity of batteries. Technology has far outstripped those dreams we had, and it continues to do so. Whatever projection we've had, we've beat it. We've decreased the cost of solar much more rapidly than any believe, anybody believed possible. And I just made reference to this little, you know, bat, well, it's not little, it's a huge factory they're already building in Maltby, Washington to make a more advanced battery. Uh, I, admit, I don't know if I mentioned we're making the first all electric airplane in Arlington. Uh, so technology is going so fast, our ambitions have to catch up with it. And, and, and that's a job for the supranationals a little bit. Right. So uh, speaking of the supranationals, uh, you're going to be attending COP26 in a few weeks. You had attended uh, COP23 in Bonn uh, with a number of other governors, and that was right after or shortly after um, America had withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. America is now back in. So I'd like to um, ask you what your thoughts are about uh, COP26 and what supranationals can impart at that conference and also what your what success at COP26 would means to you. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, <laughs> just one little story in Bonn, the administration was going to a press conference to say why they're withdrawing and doing nothing. And Senator Brown and I hijacked a press conference. We got there five minutes early and took it over and told them the real story out of America, which is there's progress. So we'll try to have some fun as well. But but listen, we, we have a large group that will be there and we will raise the flag and have real achievements and, and real, uh, uh, real commitments. And I'm confident it's going to help the dialogue and it's going to help us back home too. So every governor who can go home and say, look, I had 50 other governors from around the state and the, the world who's joined us in this commitment. It's easier coming back home. We support each other. The support of other mayors and governors supports each other. Uh, and I've met some tremendous leaders around the world. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Governor Jeju Province, uh, Governor uh, Juan, done fantastic work in the last uh, decade. Uh, uh, John Horgan, Premier of British Columbia. You know, just these are inspirational people. And so we inspire each other. And the commitments we're going to make, you know, are pretty ambitious. 100% uh, zero emission vehicles by 2035, 100% zero emission buses by 2030, 100% zero emission light duty public fleets by 2035. These are real commitments that these supranationals are going to make. And we think it will uh, uh, create a higher level ambition for our nation states, but it doesn't matter. And I want to point this out. Even if the nation states fall asleep and, and just have cocktail parties and don't do anything, we're going to do something because we're moving the ball. And we can move the ball. As, as I've indicated, our U.S. Climate Alliance represents 61% of the U.S. economy. So even if the Congress does not produce, and I believe they will this year in the reconciliation bill, ultimately after much gnashing of teeth, and we're committed to that. I spoke to the White House a few days ago about that. So I believe that they will come through for us. But even if they didn't, we're capable of doing all this work in some sense ourselves, and we're doing it. Uh, 
so we are not going to be slowed down by Washington, D.C. Washington State is always going to be ahead of Washington, D.C., and we're, we're proud of that in some sense. So even if we got the best reconciliation bill in human history, we're still going to have a higher standard here in Washington State. And, and every, every supranational on this list can, can have that same level of ambition. So I'm looking forward to, to this meeting, and I think we're going to get some good things done. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and I was there when you and uh, Governor Kate Brown came out of that uh, call session. You were very excited. <laughs> yeah, it's, really, it's all an international protocol, but right, yeah. right. Yeah, I, I think you broke some rules, but um, you know that that happens. Uh, I, I, you have grandchildren, um, and so. I know you're thinking about the future, the future of the planet, the future of your family, uh, the citizens in your state, in the United States, and around the world. So, what gives you hope in terms of that we can that we can address this climate crisis, and uh, and provide a future um, for humans on this planet? A few things. Number one, uh, the innate, incredible genius of of the human mind that we're seeing playing out in my state. I can't turn around without meeting a mechanical engineer who has a whiz-bang technology that's going to decarbonize the economy. I mean, literally, I, I'm driving up to Seattle. I'm going to pass three companies that I met with that are breaking ground on new factories to build uh, better, uh, you know, uh, better batteries and electric planes and, you know, and so the genius of humans is, is kind of almost unimaginable. And now we're unleashing it. We're unleashing that innate power because we're demanding these products. I've always thought the purpose of government, governors, is to create a demand for genius. So when we create a cap and invest bill and a clean fuel standard and a ZEV mandate, that's what creates a demand to unleash this genius. We're providing the demand. They're providing the genius. And fortunately, it's coming. So just recognizing the plasticity of the human mind and what it can create that gives me uh, a huge hope. Second, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, I just can't believe that such a brilliant species would accept its own destruction. I just cannot accept that, that that, that is either in the master plan or even uh, evolution. So a species that understands evolution, fundamentally, I can't believe would allow its own extinction in some sense. And that's a, maybe a philosophical belief. But third, we all have something in common, and we love our kids and our grandkids. And that is a universal trait amongst all cultures and faiths and countries. And that ultimately should power uh, our ambition to solve this crisis. And it is now upon us. I'm looking out at a white pine tree that's dead right out my window here, killed by the heat dome that we had, unprecedented heat. And uh, we have our grandkids that we all, we all share this. This is something all humans share. So I believe that's ultimately going to power us uh, to save ourselves here. And lastly, what do you have to say to the young people that are obviously very distraught and concerned that you know not has a lot been, has been done since even 1960 and, and even earlier when climate change was brought up as, as a real peril? And what do you say to those young people? Uh, go get them and be demanding and take no prisoners of the old folks. Uh, you should demand your parents and your grandparents not do to you what's going on right now. And they should be unrepentant and unrestrained in their demands for, for their elders. They have every moral right to do so, and we need them to do so. So, uh, you know, this is a time to be loud and, and obnoxious uh, and demanding because it's morally the right thing to do. And we need them. We need more of them, frankly. If there's one thing that I think that we're maybe missing here is the, the vocality of youth in this regard. Uh, we need the same level as during the Vietnam War, frankly, uh, when my generation spoke out against that. And that doesn't mean we don't honor the, off, the people who fought it. I have huge honor for our military forces who fought in that war, but we need to look, you know, young voices to be the voice of demanding change here. It's the nature of generations. So have at them and, uh, be unrestrained in your criticism of elders at this moment. 
great, great words to end, uh, end on. And I do look forward to seeing you and your staff uh, in COP in a few weeks. And uh, so safe journeys there. See you there. Have we'll, have, we'll have some haggis over some pipes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Be well. <laughs> Uh, now I'd like everybody to take a quick five minute break before we resume with our next panel, uh, driving capital and innovation towards global decarbonization. Thanks everybody. <laughs>